Thanks for taking the time to listen to this weekly sermon from Southside Baptist Church in Florence, South Carolina. Our vision is to know God and make Him known. We now offer two services on Sunday mornings. Our classic service begins at 8.30 a.m. and our modern service is at 10.45. Please visit our website at southsidenow.church to find out more about how we are making disciples in the Florence area. For now, sit back and take in this week's message from God's Word. Today is Testimony Sunday. Um, Last year, about a year ago, um, we had our first Testimony Sunday here on a Sunday morning, and uh, man, it just went great. It was great to hear the testimonies of so many people in our church and what God had done in their life, and um, had many asked, when are we going to do that again? And um, I thought, you know, this would be a good time to have um, Testimony Sunday again and hear what the Lord has done in some of the folks' lives, what He's doing right now, and uh, I believe it. Just after this morning, it'll encourage you, it'll help you, and um, I think it'll help build your faith. I want to read you a Bible verse. It's out of of Psalms 107, verse 1 and 2. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others He has redeemed you from your enemies. That's what we're called to do as Christians. God's given every one of us a testimony to share. To influence others for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So at this time, um, I'm going to have Mr. Zach Bennett, if you'll come up here on the side. Zach Bennett is um, uh, one of our deacons here at Southside, and um, his wife Brittany um, uh, you know, serves here as well and serves as a, a teacher in our community, and they have a son named Turner. And uh, just appreciate Zach and his family. And um, Zach, the floor is yours, my friend. Morning, Southside. Uh, as preacher mentioned, my name is Zach Bennett. Uh, I've been coming to Southside for a little over six years, uh, and my wife Brittany and I joined just a little over five years. But before that, uh, I grew up in a small community about 20 minutes south of here in Friendfield, uh, where as a kid I was, you know, I went to church. I was I was in RAs and, and and went to vacation Bible school pretty often, but I didn't really have that relationship with God yet. Uh, and it wasn't until my freshman year of high school, uh, with the leadership and guidance of of some wonderful grandparents that I have that I actually accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. And uh, it's, it's one of the many blessings that to, in life to be able to have a relationship with, with grandparents because oftentimes they kind of fill in the gaps that, that maybe your parents that maybe missed on. And uh, it's one of the things that I thank God for each and every day. Uh, but fast forward from there about eight years. Um, Brittany and I are getting ready to graduate college. We're trying to make plans uh, to, to get married as a couple. Um, we, we both gone off, went off to school. She went to Charleston. I went to Columbia, South Carolina. And to be completely honest, we had no desire to move back to Florence County. Um, And and so we started applying for jobs in in different, you know, bigger, more vibrant cities. Uh, And for one reason or another, those situations just never panned out. Um, And soon thereafter, I got an opportunity to come to work for Otis Elevator uh, here in Florence, and and we've been here ever since. Uh, But part of that journey, you know, as we moved back to Florence, uh, is that, you know, Brittany, being the the spiritual leader that she is in our family, decided, hey, we've got to find somewhere to go to church. And then... Uh, like many people, we uh, Southside was one of the churches on that list, and we came and we heard uh, Preacher Crooks uh, preach at the time and, and absolutely fell in love with him. Uh, kind of reminded me of my free will Baptist background uh, growing up a little bit, uh, and, and, and a lot like what Paul's looking for, you know, as far as us being really uh, engaged and, and, and uh, you know, speaking with our bodies and our, and our voices uh, here in church and, and, and really fell in love with that. But it was the relationships we started to build in our uh, connection group with Tim and uh, Kim Ryan Han that, that really helped us build that that st- support structure and group that, that we really needed uh, one as we started to, to, to grow a family uh, and, and little did we know at the time just how, how important that that group would be to us as uh, we got ready to get married just b- about a month before uh, we were getting ready to get married um, my best man my dad uh, suddenly became sick and, and passed away from complications of open heart surgery and uh, it was during that really trying time that I understood exactly why God led me here to Florence back home um, because that was two years of my life that I got to spend uh, playing golf, uh, going fishing, uh, eating lunch on Friday, uh, you know, with him and, and just two years that I never would really get back if I had, you know, pursued what I perceived as, as, as my place and my path. Uh, and, and I think that's why it's really important for us to realize that at, at every stage in life, it, you know, it may not make sense, uh, but God's got an ultimate plan for us, and it's much more intricate and much better than anything we could, we could conceive ourselves. 
Um, and, and I think, you know, especially in the times we're in right now, it's really important uh, for us to understand that, that God's got us here for a reason, but at the same time, he's going to help us see, see us through to the other side of it. Thank you, guys. Amen. I tell you one thing I appreciate about your testimony, Zach, hearing it twice now is, especially during this time of uncertainty, of, of even maybe being aggravated, like, why isn't this working out the way that I want? But you kind of see, sometimes God allows us to see back a little bit and go, ah, I see the blessing of that time you gave right. me. And so I really appreciate that about your testimony, man, and sharing that. And so I'm sure it, uh, speaking to somebody for sure this morning, man. Thank you, sir. Awesome, brother. Thank you very much. Give me a hand. Um, next lady up, um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know her real well. I know her family, but um, I've gotten a little more to know her just, just through the testimony here this morning, and I know it's going to bless somebody's heart. Each one of these will bless somebody's heart all in a different way, but um, it's Miss Abby Wilson. She's one of our teenagers here. She's in our youth group, and I really appreciate her. I, she um, um, has um, uh, led a, a really young young ladies Bible study. My daughter's been a part of this summer, and really appreciate her leading that. And um, I, I know this is going to touch your heart. And she's a brave young lady, and really appreciate you, Miss Abby. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Go right ahead. Hey, that's okay. You got it now. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm 17 years old. So, a little back, I've been coming here for about three years, four years. I've been really involved in the youth, and it's been really great. So, a little background um, I was born into a Christian family. <laughs> um, my dad was a youth pastor. He used to be the youth pastor here and at um, Calvary. So, I was really blessed into being born into this family. I grew up with really good morals. I went to a Christian school, and I grew up a good kid, I'd like to say. Um, so around in middle school, seventh and eighth grade, I was in the IBMYP program. And it's like a program for smart people. And I wasn't, I did not apply myself. I wasn't very smart. I didn't get good grades. I, I was at like the bottom of my class. And people weren't very nice. <laughs> um, I was always a really happy person. I was like, if you know me, you know, I always try and find the good in situations, and I'm always finding things to laugh at, and that's how I was. And people didn't really like that, I guess. Um, they found ways to, like, get into my head, and I had really bad, like, self-worth issues, and I was like, okay. Um, well, I fell into this depression, and I was only, like, 14 or 13, so it was young. I was young to go through that, and it was hard because I didn't know that much about people and all that kind of stuff. Um, so eighth grade year, it got kind of bad. And I thought to myself, this will all just go away if I go to heaven. If I just go straight up there with Jesus, like I won't have to worry about any of this. I can just leave it all behind. It won't matter anymore. And I'll be so much happier. And It got bad, and one night I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm tired of everything here. So I, I nearly killed myself, and something, it stopped me, and I didn't know what it was. I still called myself a Christian, but something in my head was saying, you, you can't do this. Think about your parents. Think about your friends. You can make a difference. And so I didn't do it. Thank goodness. I mean, I'm here. <laughs> um, and so... After that, I left the IB program. I didn't have social media for a year. Social media is a blessing and a curse. Um, but I didn't have it for a year, and it was really good. And I started at South Florence in ninth grade, and I was dancing. I was a dancer for a while. And I met a bunch of new people. Like, I know you all know Ellie. <laughs> she invited me here to the Christmas party during my freshman year. And... I was never connected in a youth group like here, like the one here. So I started coming, and I started getting really involved in the youth group, and it was really cool. And I got to meet a bunch of new people, and my best friends. I've made so many best friends here and people that I can trust. Um, so 
10th grade year, we went on the New York City mission trip and we got to help so many people. We got to change so many people's lives and it was really cool to see that. Um, and then the next year, last year, I quit dance and then I joined cheer. But um, we were about to go back on the same mission trip and slowly I started falling back into that sadness that I was in. I still, again, call myself a Christian. I would raise my hands in worship, but I didn't know what it was like to know God. And I fell back into it, and I thought if I just kept it to myself, then it would just get better and it would go away, but it didn't. And if it weren't for that New York City mission trip, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> um, I opened up about it to my friends, and it made things better. I didn't feel enough, and I was told that I was enough. But I still was missing something. And so the next month in January, we went to a conference called Strength to Stand, and it was, it's, it was life-changing for me. Um, this guy talked a message. He preached about depression, and it really hit home. Um, he said, one of the quotes was, um, God isn't the light at the end of the tunnel. He's the light that comes into the tunnel to save you. And that really, really spoke to me. And I was like, okay, I want to know what it's like to really live for God. Because I see all these people like Sadie Robertson and um, different influencers like that. They're, they seem so happy. They seem so joyful. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be a light. And so that day after worship, everyone was sobbing. <laughs> it was it was a lot. Um I fully gave my life to Christ. I was like, okay, I, I really want to do this. Um, I want to see what this is all about. And I didn't tell anyone, <laughs> um, but I knew that I had made a good decision. And that night I was going through something and I didn't know what to do. And that night I prayed to God for the first time. And the next day he provided and I was like, okay, God's real. Um, <laughs> I need to live for this guy. Um, so I started living for him these past few months, um, since January, and they have been a great few months. Um, it was amazing. Um, I have TikTok, <laughs> you don't know what that is. Um, you make videos and you can post them. And I started like getting followers and all this kind of stuff from posting Christian TikToks about like church camp. And it was, it was exciting. I got a lot of feedback and a lot of people were praying for me and I was praying for them and I was reading my Bible every day. It was, it was really awesome. Um, and a verse that I had written down, um, or not written down, <laughs> but um, this is a verse that I live by. It's Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. And that's the verse that I live by. Like whenever someone would ask me, what's your favorite Bible verse? I would say Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And so slowly, um, I started falling back into these old habits of thinking of what I look like or how I act um, and what people think of me. And it kind of got bad again. Um, this was like my third time going through a depression. And um, I was being a hypocrite. I would post, oh, go read your Bible. This will be the best thing for you. But I wasn't doing that myself. And it got bad again. And you're probably expecting me to say, I got over it again. I didn't. Um, I just opened up to my parents about it after months of going home and crying every single day, sobbing into my pillow, just alone, not saying anything. I opened up to my parents about it Friday night. Shout out. <laughs> um, but... It's gonna get better, and I'm excited for it to get better so that I can get back into these old habits, and I was so happy living for God. Um, so I'm excited to get back there, and the worship, it really spoke to me. Just now, I was asking God um, this morning to speak to me, and the song says, the enemy can't take what I have or change who I am because I belong to you, and that, <laughs> that really hits home here. He can't change me. Um, if God brought me out of depression twice, I know he can do it again. So I'm so thankful that 
he's present in my life and that I have people around me that can help me. And if you're struggling with anything like this, I know it's scary, but reach out to people. <laughs> I'm not good at reaching out to people about my emotions, but reaching out to people really, really does make a difference. So, yeah, sorry. Very, very good, Abby, and you're very brave for sharing that. And I know there's someone watching or someone here, regardless of what age they are, or they're, you know, same age as you, it's something that speaks speaks to people and we all have hurts we all have a struggle and the enemy loves to loves to seclude us and and wants others to think that wants us to think that man if if anyone knew that i had a, a hurt or an issue and that man what would they think of me but the fact is we all do and we need we need the lord's help and we need also our brothers and sisters in christ not to judge us but to come alongside of us to love on us in our struggles amen we need that and um, because none of us uh, are perfect. And I tell you, Abby, our enemy loves to replace God's truth with a lie. And, um, and the answer is to replace that lie with God's truth. Amen. So give Miss Abby a hand. Thank you so much, Miss Abby. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, next is Miss Amy Thompson. And so, Miss Amy Thompson, if you'll come up, she's going to share um, her testimony and some things about Honduras and just love the Thompson family. And um, she um, served 10 years as our Awana commander and uh, did a great job. And she's moving to some other ministries here in our church. And, but um, I just want to give her a hand for serving the Lord for 10 years. <laughs> Um, our testimonies evolve every day um, as a believer in Christ, the things that you encounter. Um, Friday, I forgot to mention this first service, but I got real close to Jesus because my son got his driver's license. <laughs> so, um, and his daddy's going to get real close when he calls to add him on his insurance, I'm sure. Um, every day, look for him in the little things. So this past September, um, September February, um, we were in Honduras in a village called Cedros, um, and there was a group of us that actually got to go and build a church in a village called Monte Redondo. Um, it's kind of a long story, so I'm going to read to you um, out of my journal from the trip, tell you kind of what was going on with it. Um, there had been a pastor there that had pastored for 40 years. Um, we go with a group called BMDMI, Baptist Medical Dental Missions International, and they sponsor several things there. Um, they have an orphanage, um, children's home, they have a Bible Institute where they train um, young men to become pastors. And he was actually one of the, the first pastor to graduate from there and had since been pastoring for 40 years. Um, he had been praying for years for a church for this community. Um, Honduras is a very poor country. So when I tell you that they were praying for a church, he was not praying for anything that looked like this. Um, what we ended up with was a cement block, four wall building, um, crushed rock floors, that we were able to put a roof on, a tin roof, while we were there. Um, he had prayed the year before um, with one of the ladies from the team that had been there previously, a doctor in one of the clinics, and he had specifically asked her to pray for a church building. So she went home, um, and she continued to pray. God had impressed it upon her heart that it was not something he was going to let go with her. And over the course of several months, um, they were actually able to raise $27,000, which bought the land and built the church. Um, the neat part of this is the church was to be dedicated to the son of Dr. Paul Friel and his wife, Miss Becky. Um, they also were on the trip with us. Their son um, was a student at Clemson, died tragically several years ago. So they had been searching for closure um, searching for peace about that whole situation. So through God's handiwork, um, he took a group of Americans to work and do a medical clinic in this village, connected a pastor and a doctor that prayed together. The doctor went home and continued to pray um, and got people involved with her that knew the frills, that knew their son, and they were able to raise that money to build the church. So the pastor's prayers were answered. Um, and then God was glorified through the death of a son um, and will continue to be as people continue to come to know Christ um, in, that, in that church. Um, 
the last day that we were there, we went and we had a dedication service for the church. And it was neat. Um, there was about 100 people there. There were the mission team was there. There were some of the local residents that worshiped there, pastors. And after the service at the very end, um, we laid hands on the pastor and the frills. And everybody there laid hands on each other and prayed out loud, um, all different sizes and shapes and colors of people, different languages, all praying out loud to God. Um, it was probably the most incredible experience that I've ever had as a believer. Um, to experience that, to feel the Holy Spirit working like that, it was powerful. Um, and I know that is just a small taste of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. Um, to hear all those voices crying out to him at one time and know that he hears and that he's answering. Um, I learned that building a church is a labor of love. Um, it takes a long time. You get dirty. Um, it's hard work. And I'm not just talking about the walls. I'm talking about the people that fill God's church, the people that make up God's kingdom. Matthew 16, 24 says, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Um, taking up your cross is suffering for the building of God's kingdom. It is not hardships that you fall into. Um, it's just not bad times that come around. It is you voluntarily stepping up um, to suffer for the sake of Christ. Um, and you must do this to truly follow Christ. Do not be a comfortable Christian. <laughs> um, be a follower of Christ. Get your hands dirty. Um, sweat a little bit. Get very uncomfortable to win people for him. Um, I don't think it's an option. I think if you truly are a follower of Christ, then you must be in the business of going and making disciples. Um, so we just so happen to have a meeting at 3 o'clock today. We would love for you to go to Honduras with us. Um, if you've never been on a mission trip, you want to get plugged in, maybe not there, other places, please tell me. Um, I have been blessed over the years to be opportunity of many different trips. I can get you plugged in. I will tell you that to experience God there is nothing like what you experience here. Um, we're too comfortable. We have too many nice things around us. And we really don't, as Americans, know what it's like to truly suffer for him. But if you can just go somewhere and get just a taste of that, um, it will change your life forever. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Miss Angus. <laughs> Next person is Richard Dean. He's going to speak about Honduras as well. And as he's coming up, we um, want you to know, we'll have a sign out there coming up this next Sunday, but underneath our TV in the foyer, there's an area for our, we collect for our food pantry, and we have some t-shirts. Then on the, on the right-hand side, that's where we'll be collecting um, shoes, clothing, caps, and he'll explain a little more about what they're collecting that they take over and they use at the minister at Honduras. And so instead of, um, you know, donating to Goodwill um, or even some other places, bring it here and they'll get it situated and uh, you'll get a blessing out of that, a blessing um, those uh, children and, um, and adults as well over there in Honduras. But Brother Dean, Brother Dean, his, man, his whole family, they serve in some capacity here at Southside. And so we just appreciate them. And uh, if you're like, I haven't seen Richard much. Like, where's Richard been? He's usually um, <clears throat> running sound for us in some capacity. And so he only gets noticed when he messes up. And so, um, which, is he, often. which is <laughs> not, not the bad man, but go ahead, Brother Dean. Actually, we got, we got Zeb for second service now, and he's doing a wonderful job there. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of tag along on what Amy was talking about with the church dedication. I want to share with you what we do, what the, a typical week looks like, and what a typical day looks like uh, for the mission trip, because I'm, uh, we've, I've been on this team for... For years, I've gone four different times, and Amy's been on this same team uh, for two years, uh, and, it, and it becomes a core team, but it, it's never been a, a Southside thing, okay? I want, it, I want Southside to kind of take some ownership of this team as well. I mean, there's, there's people from Missouri, people from North Carolina, people from, from Conway and Pennsylvania, I believe. The, the team's made up of a bunch of different people from different places. But I, I want it to be a Southside thing too. So that, that's what I'm going to tell you about. 
But what's one of the one of the major words whenever you go on a mission trip is flexibility, because what you expect is not always where God's going to lead you. And the church dedication was one of those because we had never had I'd never been involved with a church dedication there, but it was a wonderful thing. And, and one of the things that Amy didn't say was after after we dedicated it, they wanted us to have a sharpie, and then it was like cinder block walls. Everybody was to write on the wall a verse so that we'll always be a part of that church. The plan is to paint the walls at some point, but even painted over, those verses are on those walls. So and my, my verse was uh, out of Colossians, uh, in him all things consist. Because not only did he create everything, but he sustains everything. So here, here's what it looks like a typical BMDMI uh, mission trip in Honduras. You, you arrive on Saturday, you go to the mission house, um, you spend the night there, and then Sunday you go off to whatever town you're going to go to. Whenever you get there, you set everything up and get ready. Sometimes you have a little time to, uh, to, to start, but depending on how far out you go, uh, it may just be getting set up and ready for the next morning. So uh, as, as you wake up, we, have a, you, we usually have like a... a, a not really a testimony, but a, a, somebody gives a dedication or uh, a little devotion. And uh, with that devotion, we start off our day. Um, in order to go through all the different areas, you have to have a card. And you get that card by going to a service. So we've got several pastors that will rotate doing tent services. And they'll get their card. Um, from there, they get their uh, vital signs taken. Uh, from there, they go to medical where uh, doctors and nurses are seeing usually uh, people in families. And then uh, everything that they have that they, that they need taken care of, most people go there for uh, runny nose, bone pain, uh, just, just to get to stock their shelves with, with Tylenol, sinus medicine, that kind of thing. But anything that is really beyond that, uh, we have what's called Project Life, where they can have a surgery done in Tegucigalpa, which is the main area there, and that's paid for by the team. So we're, we're there to see them and take care of their medical needs. They get to go to pharmacy and, of course, get the medicines that's been prescribed for them. Uh, they also get to go to dental. Um, there's, there's a lot of teeth that need being pulled there. We usually pull, like, uh, I guess a two to three tooth uh, per person average. Um, but So they get the, met, the dental. Uh, we also have a clothes closet, and that's what we've been asking uh, to, to get the clothes for that Lucas was referring to. Uh, anything from infant up to about extra large, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take those down there, men's, women's, children, shoes, hats, toys, especially kind of like the same toys you would do for Operation Christmas Child. Um, definitely we need boys' toys, but stuffed animals, stuff like that, we'll take any of that. If you, if you bring something that we can't use, We'll, we'll trade it for something that we can. <laughs> so you've got the clothes closet. We also have um, an eye clinic. Um, my oldest daughter, Mary Rose, went one time, and she said it was truly a blessing to, to see people that have never had glasses all of a sudden get glasses and be able to see and, and look at a baby for the first time with different eyes. Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. So being able to do that. Um, we have... Uh, a vacation Bible school like children's church there that's kind of going on all throughout the day as well. Um, and uh, let's see, what am I leaving out? Be beans and rice, we give out beans and rice. So we basically go there to take care of their needs, but we're also sharing the gospel. They hear the gospel before they get their card, and then in each of the areas, medical, dental, it's kind of hard in pharmacy, but children's church, wherever they go, the gospel's being shared there as well. So, so we, get, um, we get cards from decisions made from every area. Uh, there's, there's also, depending on what the makeup of our team is, we'll have construction, uh, which sometimes goes off about an hour's drive at least, you know, not at least, at most, uh, to do work with that. So um, we've never built a church before. Usually it's kind of maintaining a church or putting a floor in or something like that. So there, there is a construction crew typically, um, but we have also needs in team support, which is putting out fires. Um, we have a kitchen crew, of course, to feed all those people. So if you want to go on a mission trip, come at 3 o'clock. 
learn a little bit more about it. We'd love to have you come with us. We've got room on the team. Uh, but if it's not your thing, or if you want to go on a mission trip somewhere else or here in, in Florence, that's fine too. Partner with us. Pray for us, okay? We, we need prayer for the people that we're going to see in Honduras. Um, pray about their needs, get their hearts prepared, get our team's hearts prepared and ready. Um, pray for Amy and I as, as, as leaders. I've never, I've never led anything like this before. Um, pray for BMDMI because they get their money through teams and with the coronavirus and everything going on, they haven't had near as many teams going on. Right now, everything is all systems go, uh, but that's a kind of a fluid situation. Just be praying for us. Also, the, the clothes and donations, monetary donations, um, partner with us in any way that you can because I want this to be a Southside thing. So that's it. Thank you, brother. We have two more. Next is uh, Brother J.C. Long. Come on up here, Brother J.C. He is a semi-retired pastor, and I uh, really appreciate him and his wife, his wife Betty. And um, he um, has been a minister in the area for a while and came, when, when did you all come, about a year a year ago or so, about, about a year? We joined Southside in 2019, 2019. six, eight months ago. Yeah, okay. It's been pretty accurate. Uh, and uh, the next, since I had you up here, anymore. the next steps class wasn't too bad, was it? It was great. It was great, see? So I got someone, yeah. We went to the class. We went joined. to the class. It was about two hours, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, for a preacher, I wasn't even lying about how long it was going to take. This but. guy is a great and wonderful pastor, and we love him dearly. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, my friend. Your turn. Okay. Good morning, young folks. I'm one of the old folks. Uh, we go to the... Why did they make the old folks get up at early and come in at 8.30? Whoa. <laughs> It's backwards. <laughs> uh, I heard all these testimonies this morning, and they all touched my heart. Abby, I've suffered from depression all my life, and all of my teachers except one thought I was a dunce. There are some teachers in this room right now See if you can recognize some of the late bloomers you're teaching and give them a little bit of slack. We can come along. We can come along. I, uh, I want to tell you that I have never in my life been confined to five minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> I'm a Baptist preacher. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, I will preach, teach, testify, or just tell stories all day long to anybody that <laughs> wants to suffer through listening. <laughs> I, I'm gonna try, I promised Pastor Lucas I would try to cut my comments a little bit shorter this, this morning early. I, I talked talk way too long. When I was a toddler, uh, my old, two older brothers and my sister took me to uh, the cradle roll in a Baptist church and I, I have loved God and Jesus all my life. Uh, and and I, my family was impoverished for four years. When I turned seven, uh, things picked up a little bit. And I started, uh, we all became active in a Methodist church in a little town of Bamberg. Um, I found some people that know about Bamberg, not very many. And uh, we, we studied the catechism and we, we memorized the 100th Psalm, 23rd Psalm, and Beatitudes. And, and at the end of the Vacation Bible School, which was two weeks, twice a day, uh, Bible study in the morning, arts and crafts, and play practice in the afternoon. At the end of the two weeks, we had a huge uh, picnic for the whole little town, and uh, it, it was all marvelous. And at the end of that, uh, about 15 or 20 of us were baptized in the Methodist Church. I can still feel the water trickling down the back of my neck. 15 or 20 of us knelt around the altar, and the preacher came by and baptized each one of us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Uh, I will say that I was baptized proper. 
<laughs> later in life. Uh, and I joined, when I got out of the Navy, we joined the Baptist Church in Columbia. I was going to Carolina, and uh, my wife and I worked my wife and I worked my way through college and three years of seminary. But uh, at the end of the college, I said, Lord, no, 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 not preaching, no, anything but that. And I said, Lord, I'll be a teacher. And actually, I discovered that teaching is my spiritual gift. So upon graduation, I taught English and Spanish at what was then Hammond Academy, actually the first year of Hammond Academy, which is now uh, Hammond Schools in Columbia and uh, after a short time there several years uh, I let the devil get a hold of me and I went for the money and I went into administration where I didn't not belong but I was able to double my salary the first two years and after that doubled it again and uh, <clears throat> but I started off teaching at 4,300 your teachers <laughs> read it and weep so uh, when I got out of the Navy, I went to school, joined the Baptist Church, I started teaching, and went into administration in the Independent Schools Association. And uh, in, in 1976, I, I, I really, the, the call just got too strong. It got real strong. And so I, I, I uh, had a conference with my pastor every Friday morning for, for about six, eight months before we decided to definitely go to Southeastern Seminary. And uh, that, was, that was three very uh, extreme years. Uh, wife and two children, two little children, to pull them out of private school, put them into public schools, couldn't fo afford the other. And uh, uh, moved to Florence and uh, accepted a call to a church in Baptist Church in Florence in 1980 and uh, served there several years and then I became the founding pastor of a new church Oakdale Baptist Church just here in Florence too most people don't know where it is that by one of the golf courses and uh, we built that church uh, from the ground up there uh, uh, were over 200 people involved in building Oakdale Baptist Church all volunteers uh, we borrowed $100,000, and, and I retired after 19 years and there as pastor, and uh, we were debt-free at that time. Uh, we borrowed $100,000. Our church was appraised at over $300,000 uh, when I retired. Uh, we did everything from digging the ditches, laying the rebar, to putting on the shingles with our own bare hands, and it, it was tough. Tough missionary. Uh, all missionary work is tough, but so rewarding. I want to tell my story as quick as I can with books. This is a Bible, a King James Version, zippered, red letter edition, my name engraved on it. Got it in sixth grade. I tried to read it. This Bible has never, ever been read by anybody. And I was in the Navy. I did a lot of uh, janitorial work and kitchen help work, nine months of it. Also went to uh, electronic school and became uh, an avionics tech, and combat air crewman, as a matter of fact, flew off aircraft carriers. And uh, uh, I got an honorable discharge, by the way, good conduct medal. <laughs> uh, before that, no, during that time, I was hitchhiking back and forth to Orangeburg went way out of the uh, 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 allowed area for a weekend leave. But every weekend, I went to Orangeburg. <clears throat> Took about nine hours to drive it. There was no interstate. Uh, hitchhiking anywhere from uh, up to 19 hours one way. Uh, but I went to see my wife. She was sitting right there this morning. She, she couldn't bear to listen to me again now, but... <laughs> God bless her. Uh, we're coming up on our 60th anniversary. Uh, she's the most wonderful wife God ever gave a man. Her name's Betty. When you see her, please speak to her. Uh, I was hitchhiking home one time, and I got 15 miles above Highway 301. There was no interstate. And a man picked me up, and his car was just filled with fishing tackle. I learned later that he was uh, a world 
champion fly caster. And he worked for the, uh, I think it was the Hedden uh, Fishing Tiger Company, and he gave demonstrations, et cetera. But he was a Christian. He was a safe Christian. And I, I, I was with him a total of about 15 minutes, and he took me to 301. I knew I could catch a ride there. It was in the middle of the night. I knew I could catch a ride on 301. And I went to get out of the car, and he said, wait a minute, we're going to pray. And I said, um, what? <laughs> say, say, what? <laughs> and he said, uh, he bowed his head and closed his eyes and said, do you know a prayer? First he said, are you a Christian? And I didn't answer him. He said, well, you ain't. <laughs> and then, then he said, we're going to pray. And he bowed his head and closed his eyes, and I closed my eyes, and, he, and it, it was silence. He said, do you know a prayer? <laughs> and I, I shook my head. He said, okay, you can repeat after me. You can pray after me. This was a prayer. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That was it. Straight out of the Bible. Luke 18, 13. That is a, a, the most powerful verse and the most powerful prayer I have ever prayed. But it took a while for it to sink in uh, as growth is slow and laborious. Uh, but it happens. Uh, uh, sometime later, I happened to be driving home from Norfolk for a weekend. And I got out on a stretch of Interstate 95 that had just opened. It there wasn't even in lines point, painted on it yet, but they had it open to the public. And it bypassed a couple of two or three towns in North Carolina. And I was driving down there at about 2 o'clock in the morning by myself. And uh, the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart and just squeezed it and turned it wrong side outwards, and, and I wept. I, I was alone with the Lord, and I wept most of the way home. And I said, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do except preach. <laughs> so, so I taught, uh, and, I, and I went into administration in the private school in 1977. That's when I went to seminary. Uh, my wife and two children, and uh, I uh, was the founding pastor of Oakdale Baptist Church. Uh, in 1961, my wife gave me this Bible, and one of my Navy buddies said, uh, God, Jesus, you could be a preacher with that Bible. <laughs> Uh, since I've retired, I've been writing. I wrote this first book, Jesus' List, Are You On It? Uh, Essentials of Salvation and Spiritual Growth. Uh, I gave the pastor one of these. He never has commented about it. I don't know whether he likes it or not. Uh, <laughs> he might tell me one day, hey, that was a pretty sorry book. I, I, I'm self-published, very expensive, very costly. But I do it anyway because I feel like I've got to. My, this book just came out last week. Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. Another flawed man called by God. One nation under God. I can tell you that the United States of America has an enemy. And it's not flesh and blood. It's the devil. The devil wants to take America down. And we are either one nation under God or we are one used to be free country. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Lucas, this is the copy that I've uh, autographed for you. Thank you, sir. And let me know how you like it. I will. I will. <laughs> I do have that book. It is on my desk. It's on my <laughs> reading list. You're going to read it one day. <laughs> Thank you, Brother JC. Well, Thank man. you. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. I love you. Love you too, buddy. You got her? Oh, I got you. All right. I'm not worried about you getting down. It's how you get down right there. Well, last but not least um, is Ian Bateman. And um, he uh, serves as a, a connection group leader. And his wife helps teach kids. And just, just a wonderful family. And asked him here this morning to give his testimony. Um. You know, what's neat about also this testimony time is uh, three of the six people up here have been in our church less than three years and um, are newer people. And so God is still, he's working here at Southside and bringing new folks here and 
and part of our church family. And so let's give Brother Ian a hand. Good to see you, my friend. Good morning. Well, as Lucas said, my name is Ian Bateman, and um, probably one of the newer members here. My wife and I joined probably a little less than two years ago, my beautiful wife, Shannon. Uh, and we, we believe we were led here. We're so thankful to be here at Southside. Uh, when we uh, moved to Florence, we knew we were moving months in advance, and, and we spent a lot of time in prayer where we were to go and where we were to serve. And, and this is where he led us. And uh, we're, we're so thankful that he led us here. And I look forward to, we look forward to many years of, of worship together and serving uh, the kingdom together. So um, I'll get started. I'll, I'll jump right in. I was, I was not raised in a Christian home. I did not have that advantage. Um, I was sent to church as a small boy a few times. And I think as parents, we all understand the difference between being sent to church and being taken to church. So um, we were not church people. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, and he, he struggled with that for years, years and years, long after I was grown and had, had a family. But he finally got sober. I didn't share this earlier, but he finally got sober before. He passed away for, uh, he was sober for several years. Um, but that's, a, that's another story I'd like to share with y'all one day. But um, I grew up in that home. It was, uh, he was an alcoholic, and, and my mom did the best she could. And it was, it was, a, tough, it was a tough way to, to go. It was a little, little bit of a tough home to uh, grow up in, and it was a very tense atmosphere and, and everything that goes along with it. Um, but when I was 12, a young man lived down the road from us, um, David Curry, uh, a seminary student, invited me to church and took me to church. And I went a few times, and I heard the gospel of Jesus for the first time. And it just grabbed my heart and it squeezed it. And I knew, I mean, I've got to have that. And so one Sunday evening, um, at the end of the service, we all s stood up to sing, and, and I said to this morning, it was probably just as I am, because we seem to sing that one a, a whole lot. Um, I stepped out in that aisle, and I walked down, and I accepted Jesus, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and it was, it was awesome. And, and, and I went there for a while, and, and I would love to sit up here and, and tell you that, you know, Ever since then, I've been walking with the Lord, and it's just been a great, great experience, but I can't tell you that. Um, I don't know why, maybe a combination of reasons, uh, lack of uh, discipleship and the environment that I was, I was in, um, I started to drift away. You know, my parents uh, divorced when I was a 16-year-old boy, and that's, uh, that's a little tough. 16 years old is tough for a boy, period. Uh, uh, and much less having to deal with your parents divorcing at that time. So, and that was right about the time I, I started drinking. And um, I was really good at it. I was, I was real good at it. I drank a lot. And I turned my back and was walking that way. And just kept drinking. I grew up, got out of got out of school, went to work, um, got married, married my high school sweetheart. Uh, we will celebrate our thirty third next month. Uh, I'm so thankful for her. She is truly a gift from God. Um, after a few years, we started a family. I've got three sons, and I had three little boys at that time, and now they're grown. I have three awesome, awesome sons. But at that time, my drinking had really, it was, it was getting way out of control. 
and it was getting worse. I was circling that drain of alcoholism. And I had been a witness firsthand. I had a firsthand uh, witness, a, a front row seat, if you will, to the devastation that alcohol brings to a family and to a, a man. Uh, it totally destroyed my father uh, for many, many years. Uh, it obliterated our family. I saw it in all, in all its brutality, in all its just horrific, it's hard for me to describe. I, I just seen it. It just destroyed us. But I was doing the same thing. Isn't that crazy? I, I was doing the same thing. Then one night, after a long day at work, I went out and I got just blind drunk because I don't remember how I got home. Um, God got me home. I'd passed out in a, another part of the house away from the family. And in the wee hours of the morning, and I, I've shared this with my connection group, and I shared it this morning, but other than that, I really, have, this isn't something I've shared. In the wee hours of the morning, boom, I sat bolt upright out of a drunken stupor. And I didn't hear a voice, but I heard God talking to me in my heart. I heard him talking to me just as plain as if I'm sitting right here, right now, talking to you. And he was telling me, he said to me, Ian, I did not save you for this. I did not save you to become what you are becoming. And that really just shook me to my core. And once again, I'd love to tell you I stopped drinking right then, but I can be kind of stubborn. <laughs> I got that from my father too. However, a time or two after that, when I would go to partake, the spirit was in me, beating me up so hard. I finally said, okay, I'm done. Never again. You got me. And I gave it up. I quit the drinking. I started taking my family to church. I started digging into his word. Learn how to pray. Trying to be that godly leader that and spiritual leader that God had, had meant for me to be in my home. And um, it started growing in my relationship with the Lord. And after a while, he showed me behind, behind you, look behind you. And I did. And I saw that through all those years, through all that time, through all that heartache and those that just, there's just that tough time that I lived through and, and abusing all the alcohol. Through all of that, he had never left me. He had been with me the whole time. I'm the one who had turned, but he was there. And I am so, I'm so thankful that he was. You know, he saved me twice. God saved me two, two times, really. He saved me from an eternity in hell as a boy when I answered that call, and I was saved, man. He saved me later in life from hell on earth because I was going down that road and I was going to lose it all. I would have lost my, my family and those important things. So he saved me twice. And I'm so thankful that he did. You know, you, you cannot... God is so good and he is so faithful. We cannot begin to even compute or fathom his faithfulness and his mercy and his goodness to us it's just it, it it is so awesome i've been asked several times over the years <clears throat> excuse me and been in discussions 
should Christians drink? And I understand this can be somewhat of a touchy subject when spoken from the platform or anywhere, I guess. Um, should Christians drink? I know it doesn't say in the Bible, do not drink. And this is something that I'm pretty passionate about, and if this is my opinion, and I'm not your pastor, and I can probably get away with it, but no, they should not. I don't believe, I don't believe Jesus gave his life for me. I don't believe he died on the cross for me. And I believe he did that, and he wouldn't want me to uh, be involved in an activity that was so hurtful. I believe he died for me because he loved me and he would not condone such an activity that hurt so many people and hurt so many lives. I, I, I believe he would want me to refrain from something like that. I really do. Um, so yeah, I guess in closing, you know, my testimony is I'm so thankful that God saved me. He saved me from a, a, an eternity in hell and he, he saved me from, you know, losing it here. And he's allowed me to serve him. And he's shown me so much and allowed me to grow with him uh, so, so much over the years. And he's brought me here. And I'm just, once again, I'm, I'm thankful. Thank Amen. You. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And as you've seen here this morning, um, of the testimonies of what God has saved some from and some of the struggles that they have had that we, we are not alone. And if you've never been born again, I'm not saying that you know the religious answers or you call yourself a Christian. See, when you're born again, it's how you start a relationship with Christ. It's not about just knowing the right answers, but having a relationship with him. Even if you're a member here, if you don't have that, you need that. We need to be born again. How do you get born again? One, realize that you're a sinner and that you deserve death and hell. You may be watching and go, you know what, I don't feel worthy of God's grace. That's because none of us are. But God loves us anyway. So Jesus came, was born, and lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and was a sacrifice for us on the cross. He was God. He died, and he rose again. Anyone who prays and repents of their sins and put their, puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, he will save you, he will change you, and your life will never be the same. Does it mean you will never have struggles after that? No, it doesn't mean that. Have you seen that some have had some struggles and God's gotten to pass some of those struggles? But through his power of his spirit, you can get past those things. We need his help, amen? And we need the help of other people in our church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for these testimonies, how they've praised you, how they've, how they've pointed to you, and have pointed the importance of having a relationship with you. I pray that there's someone watching or someone here this morning that does not has not been born again. Maybe they've been raised in church. Maybe they've been raised around church. Maybe they've been sprinkled, but they know, they know they're not born again. They know they have not had a relationship with you. I pray that they make that choice today to pray this simple prayer, to pray, to pray, Lord, I repent of my sins. I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus, save me. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray.